Okay, so the presentation's recorded. Um, also going to do the live transcripts at the bottom. So um, at the bottom of the screen, you should see uh, closed captioning, the words at the bottom there. Uh, if you don't want to see that, you should see a little CC box at the bottom, and it should have a little carrot, a little arrow at the top. And what you can do is you can click that little arrow and click hide subtitle. That'll take away all the words. Okay. So if you want to do that. And Faith, I'm going to go ahead and load up my um, presentation here in just a second. <clears throat> Sounds great. She got to right. it, didn't she? <laughs> Avery. Yeah, it's not um, <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, but it's enough to knock me out for the day. Okay, which one do you see in right there, Faith? Back side, your side. Okay, let me yeah. swap. All right, so we good? Yep. All right, wonderful. All right, I'm just going to stop my video. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to today's pres presentation on seasonal pests. My name is uh, Jim Davis. I'm the County Extension Director for the University of Florida um, here in Sumter County, as well as Hernando County. And uh, my program areas include natural resources, agriculture, and urban pest management. And today we have for these presentations on our Tuesdays, uh, we have Dr. Faith Oy. Faith, you want to tell everybody who you are really quick? So I'm an urban entomologist and I'm housed in Gainesville. Um, I cover cockroaches, ants, termites, all those kinds of things that will invade your structures and household insects. That, so that's, that's the really that's the really cool part of entomology, not those landscape pests. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just kidding. So uh, all right. So um get started here and forgive me for uh, there's a break in my voice today my little girl gave me a little cold so uh, I got got that to deal with today so I've in with this presentation um, I've included I didn't separate anything into each individual season because uh, you do have some overlap and there are some overlap um, with some of these pests but you know it really makes sense when dealing with some of these to, to group them in fall and winter uh, and spring and summer. And so that's what I've, that's what I've done today. And in fact, uh, Faith and I were working on a, after this project that we're finishing up uh, on one publication, um, we're going to do another publication uh, that's going to be uh, a very interesting one about uh, different pests and when they come out and stuff like that. So uh, the one of the ones that, that we want to cover first, and that's going to happen um, pretty more um, commonly now, especially into the cool season, are, are arthropods such as the mites. So Faith, this is your slide. You want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so mites and scales, right? We're going to be mm -hmm. bringing potted plants inside because our temperatures are going to be changing. And um, this, is a, this is a miniature rose that my husband and my son got for me. And my husband is a really, really good entomologist. And he got his PhDs working on um, spider mites. So we have a little window box in the kitchen and the, the rose that, the miniature rose that he and my son got, he's looking, he's looking, he goes, uh-oh. And I asked him what's going on. And he, he has eagle eyes because he's trained to see these very small arthropods. And it was spider mites and scales. So we flipped this thing over and it had also infested my basil because that's what's in the window box, right? So the solution that we had, because it was such a small scale, was to simply wash these um, scales and mites off, but they re reoccurred because they're so tiny, we just couldn't get everything. And you wanna flip that next slide, Jim? So if you look on the front, what he was looking for, if you look on the left-hand side, that's a healthy leaf, nice and shiny and green, but he was seeing stippling which is what Jim's pointing at right now. And that's what um, his eyes are trained to see, that that is not a healthy leaf. Something is going on. And that's what um, partially caused him to flip it over. So you want to hit the next slide? 
Mm. Sorry, I was muted. So uh, <laughs> one thing, one thing I also want to cover on this too, because I know we have some master gardeners on here and just mm. to refresh um, y'all's memory on this is that, you know, the stippling, um, this not only occurs um, with mice, but could occur with lace bugs. So, you know, you have those in those pests that occur in the springtime on azaleas and some right. other type, other type of plant. So, you know, don't confuse this with a nutrient deficiency. So uh, a lot of your nutrient deficiencies, you know, this is the midrib down here. What you see on the left-hand side is going to mirror on the right-hand side with, with some of your deficiencies. Um, so notice this is like, you know, all over the place. So this is a good sign. So whenever you start to see this, um, the first thing, I mean, it could be a lot of things whenever you see this, uh, but the first thing that you want to do is flip over that leaf. And it's good to have like a little hand lens and something like that and to look for those um, insects or arthropods. Uh, other, other things that you'll see with these mites and what, which alludes to this next slide is, is that webbing, right, Faith? Yes, and that's what, um, that's the other thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, that David could see because his eyes are trained to see it. I put a blue backing behind it because it's, it's hard to see if you're not looking at it, but he's seeing those little suspended mites on, with that webbing there. And that's also a sign that it's probably something that shouldn't be on your potted plants when you're bringing it in. So mites are a little bit difficult to try and eliminate. But Jim, going back to what you were saying about the stippling, right? So oftentimes people are looking for controls and the easiest thing to do with azalea lace bug and some of these after the leaves are damaged is to simply prune it off. Um, insecticides are not going to be the answer to everything. And our knee-jerk reaction is to spray. But if you're spraying on the top of the leaf, you're not going to be treating anything that's on the bottom of the leaf. So there's some systemics that may be helpful as long as you're not eating it. So I clearly was not going to be treating my basil because I'm going to be using that in, in cooking. But these eventually did respond to a systemic insecticide. Yeah, and, you know, the pruning may help, uh, you know, even if the if the threshold is really high where it's severely affecting the plant, you probably want to treat it. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. And sometimes you just want to let mother nature takes its course because sometimes you have natural predators that will be taking care of business with the mites as well. So that sometimes happens. Uh, and also make sure that whatever product you're reading, whatever product you're applying to these plants, uh, one important thing that Faith says that, you know, these pests are underneath the leaf, which makes it incredibly hard to get to. That's why sometimes systemics work uh, pretty well in those cases. But, um, you know, whatever product you're using, make sure you read the label because some of those products are temperature dependent. Even insecticidal soaps, if you're an insecticidal soaps that really at 95 degrees in the sun, hot weather, you're going to end up burning that plant. Uh, but some of those, some of those labels, um, like for horticulture oils or, you know, organocide books or whatever you have out there, um, will tell you not to spray over a certain temperature like 85, 90 degrees, because um, if not, you're going to hurt your plant. So different, different management ways to take care of this biologically and chemically and, and mechanically. Um, you'll just have to pick the right one. And of course, you know, if you need consultation and contact our wonderful master gardeners and, and horticulture agents. Um, <laughs> Surinam cockroaches. So... <laughs> It's the season for Suriname cockroaches. Um, you know, we Faith and I do our separate cockroach presentation. You know, we mainly focus in on you know the true interior invaders such as German cockroaches, which is number one. Um, the Suriname cockroaches is, is an, what we call an occasional invader, um, and people get really upset whenever they see a cockroach running inside the house. But you know, these cockroaches come in different different times. It, if people are bringing in their potted plant from outside inside, um, those cockroaches can be inside your potted plant. But also during, especially during the significant um, temperature changes, such as during, um, which we're getting into is in October, when it gets a little cooler, you know, if it gets a little rainier or whatever, these bugs, um, these certain cockroaches are seeking protection. And they'll come out of the ground and they'll try to come inside the house, especially if you accidentally leave the door open. Um, sometimes what they'll do is they'll be on the front porch, your know, front entrance way near your door uh, for protection. 
uh, and you open the door and they, and they crawl right in. It doesn't take long. Uh, that's how my cockroaches enter my house, um, for sure. And, uh, you know, my wife leaves a cup over all the cockroaches, the Surinams that wander in the house on an occasional basis. It's not that often. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, what I do is just pick it up and throw it outside. It, it, because it's, it's going to die inside your house. It's not going to live. It's, it's, it feeds on plant roots. In some cases, it can be a, a, a pest uh, in certain cases. Um, some people use these pets. <laughs> on, I think Faith has a video. Uh, let's see if it'll play here. Those are all Surinam's Faith. Yeah. That's so, pretty and crazy. That's out of a compost bin. Out of a compost bin, which is a perfect mm -hmm. because they're kind of like detritivores. So if you happen to see this cockroach, now some people think it's a beetle uh, whenever it wanders in. Don't get upset, but this is the season when you're going to start to see these insects coming inside your house for protection. So master gardeners work in plant clinic. Um, keep an eye out for this roach because that and the Australian are one of the ones that you're going to see uh, on a more frequent basis during this time of year. Okay. Or whenever we have significant rain events that could occur as well. So Faith, this is your slide as well. So um, wasp and hornets. So during this time of year, the natural food source for wasps and hornets are going to start disappearing. So they usually feed, you know, in terms of protein, they're going to be looking for caterpillars and other insects and whatnot. And so they start to become a problem for us because they're, they're getting into our living space or maybe it's the other way around. We're in their living space. And if we leave things like sugary drinks or um, picnic food and whatnot in uncovered trash cans, that's going to be very attractive to them because they're just trying to survive. They're just trying to provision their um, for their for themselves and for if they're a social social wasp or hornet, that's what they're trying to do. So. Um, we need to be really mindful about um, keeping our trash cans covered. And I put this here, the Schmidt sting insect, because entomologists, we're kind of curious by nature. And some of our friends just want to see what, how bad these stings are for these different uh, insects. And I have friends who do this kind of as a hobby. And Justin Schmidt actually wrote a book called Sting. But this will give you an idea of how painful these different stings are. So if you look at I'm not, you know, the, the fire ant is on here and the bullet ant is apparently like the most, the most painful. Some of these guys say that you just want to be rolling around on the ground and <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's that bad. Yeah. So um, that's the take home of, of this, this uh, slide here. We just want to be really mindful that they're going to be looking for food as they're we. Gonna, yeah. They're going to, yeah. and look at the velvet ant. So right there, yep. third, third, this is pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. So when we talk about velvet ant in the past, so right, right behind the bullet ant. <laughs> so don't right. get stung by those little, little critters, but you know, that's exactly true. And they start searching for food uh, in this time of year, but then only, not only uh, for them, but, um, but also periodically through European honeybees as well. And um, mm -hmm. Teresa, if you want to chime in on this, but you know, right across the right across our office in the convenience store, the honeybees are so hungry that they're going after the all the sugar, water, and the you know the bottles and water in the garbage cans. So yes. in these garbage cans, you have about forty to fifty European honeybees trying to find food, and um, and that could that could potentially, of course, they're searching for food. They're not finding a hive, but you know, accidental accidents do happen. So just keep an eye out for that. You know, I, I used to, I don't drink Cokes or Pepsis or any of those sugar products anymore. But when I did, I make sure that I always had a bottle that would have closed cap because I've heard numerous times where, where people have, you know, a wasp or something who's looking for food. They're hungry during this time of year and they actually, you know, uh, will swallow a wasp and that wasp will sting them in the throat. And then you get, then you get a bigger problem. So just to just to give our our group here an idea of Justin's sense of humor, if you want to flip to the next slide, sure. Yeah, there we go. So this is how he, he oh, if you that this is fine, we can go here. So this is how he's describing them. So the paper wasp, he puts it at, at an index three. It's caustic, burning, distinctly bitter aftertaste, like spilling a beaker of hydrochloric acid on a paper cut. So he's <laughs> he's trying to 
you know, give us an idea of how painful these things are. Oh, yellow jacket, hot and smoky, almost irreverent. Imagine W.C. Fields extinguishing a cigar on your tongue. Ow, right? That's pretty so, descriptive. <laughs> yeah. So he, he's got a good sense of humor about it. it it's worth the read. Yeah. And so this is a, some of the yellow jackets um, nest that there, that can be in the ground. I think that one on the right was one that was donated or sent to the, that's in our entomology building, right? Yes. The one on the right? Yes. It's and in the entomology is, department. Yep. So if, you, if you're if you up there visiting the um, Museum of Natural History with the butterflies, stop on over the entomology department and see some cool stuff over there and uh, check out the yellow cardinal. And uh, so this is, yeah. um, so this is a huge, um, huge nest and um you don't really want to control it with yourself. You want to have a professional because there's thousands and thousands of, of yellow jackets in that nest. Another, the, okay, I'm sure y'all were waiting for this one, it was the love bug. And um, hopefully, you I know, saw I know, that question, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I know some people are putting yes just to put yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully, some, some people actually still do believe this. That's the question we get all the time. And it's usually the love bug was created. It's a genetically altered um, uh, insect that was um, engineered to eat mosquitoes. That's the one, that's the story I've always heard about forever. Um, and so it was not created by UF. Um, this is a species that uh, reached Florida, they estimate around 1947, 1949. Um, now this is a, uh, in the Arctica. There is another species, uh, Plesia americana, which actually is a native species to, to, to North America. Um, the only way you tell a difference is that uh, with the americana and its ventral portion of the insect, it's red as opposed to black, which is in the Arctica, and it, and it doesn't have a fall um, mating flight. Uh, it does have a spring just like the, the Arctica, um, but the ones that we're seeing in the fall are all 100% uh, Neartica, and probably most likely majority of the ones that you're going to see in the spring are Neartica as well. Um, but you know, if you have love bugs and it's they have a red um, bottom, if you will, um, those could be the ones native to North America. Most people don't know that there's there's two different species there. The males are about a quarter an inch. The females are about a third inch of an inch, um, and they 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 link together as their mating flights, as you can see uh, right here. Now, there's some question as whether if they're truly really good pollinators or not. I don't know the science. I don't know anything to back that up. Maybe some of y'all can correct me on that, but um, it is suspected that they do are pretty good pollinators here. So a lot of love bugs on a pendo palm in fluorescence. Um, and uh, so another name, you know, people call these honeymoon flies, united bugs, march flies and so on a lot of different names for them um so you have the mating fights in april and may so this is one that um the seasons do overlap and in august and september and the abundance of this is really it's hit or miss and it's basically based on you know it could be environmental conditions we really didn't have a large where i'm i was at um we really didn't have a large uh, mating flight of love bugs this year, uh, both in the spring and the summer. Sometimes it could vary. You could have a light one in the spring and a heavy one in the sun in the in the fall, um, and uh, and vice versa. Um, there, this is the larva right here. Now these are these are now they're love bugs, okay? But they are flies, so they're in the order Diptera. So they're the same same order as your house fly. So they have a complete life cycle, and that's their larva, and they are considered beneficial. And some people don't know what the heck you're talking about because the larva is they it does break down organic material and it, they are considered um, they are considered detritivores. However, look what they do to your car. Um, whenever you hit a large mating flight like that, it's it's can really mess up your car. And if you don't immediately wash them off, um, it can damage your car. So an individual deposits about a female deposits about 350 eggs and decaying vegetation or grassy weedy areas. So if you're going through areas like in the panhandle, remote areas on I-10, uh, green swamp, you know, 471, where there's a lot of vegetation, not too many develops, you're gonna run into a lot of love bugs. Out on 60 near Yeehaw Junction, those areas you're gonna run into a ton of love bugs because that's what they're breeding in. 
but they're also attracted to the carbon monoxide from the uh, from your cars. Um, so you'll see them at gas stations along interstates and so on. Um, they typically are attracted to white and yellow, so probably not the best shirts to wear um, during love bug during love bug season. Um, now mating <laughs> mating takes a long time takes take about twelve hours, um, and the female love bug dies about eighty six hours of laying um, the eggs. Now, a lot of people think this is the only time you see love bugs. It's not. I, I can, you can find love bugs year round. This is just their mating flights, their swarming flights. Okay. And it's, it, it's all synchronized at one time during specific times of year. Um, you can see love bugs in December. Abs absolutely. Uh, if I take you hiking, we'll see love bugs on occasion. It's not, it's not uncommon. And, uh, but those are, these are some of these bugs out there that are, you know, that happen during that particular time of year. And there's, guess what? There's nothing you can do about it. Um, you're just going to have to wait for those populate for that swarming to end. There's don't you're not going to go out there and spray. You're not going to really do anything to, to control this population. And we have the millipedes or the thousand leggers and wait till it starts getting a little colder. Um, then usually about October, November faith is whenever we get the calls from homeowners. And I it's usually get these from the villages. Has it really? Yeah, that yeah. Yep, doesn't surprise me. So I usually get these calls um, a lot in developments such as the villages. And it's no, there's no rhyme or reason, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just, you could have one house that will have literally thousands of millipedes coming out of their grass and their mulch, climbing up on top of their house and the other houses will be fine. Um, and there'll be so many um, that they'll start, you know, getting inside the house and, uh, and people will start getting really upset about it. It's like a little plague. It's like a mini plague is whenever this happens. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of feel sorry for the people because there's, again, there's really nothing, there's very little you can do about it. Um, I don't think there's any, right? There's no, because this is not an insect. So there's no insecticides or any spray that you're going to put on there to really deter these is that is that right faith or is there something so, out so there? that's true actually i i just got a um an email from one of our our lawn guys and i told him yeah don't spray anymore the best thing that we can do is try and control the water as much as possible which is yeah. a little difficult for us in the summertime in florida yeah. second mm -hmm. thing is to just make sure that the house is tight so that they're not making their way in so put door sweeps on the doors so they're literally not walking in. If you stand on the inside of your house and you can see light around the doors and windows, that's enough for a lot of our pests to, to come in. So that's actually the number one. The number two is gonna be controlling the amount of water that goes on your lawn because you know, Jim, what we're starting to see is it's sometimes the really well manicured lawns, right? That, that have this, this millipede problem because there's a lot of water. And the third thing is, and it's not pretty, but it's to de dethatch the lawn because now you're disrupting where they're breeding. And yeah. yeah, so those are my three my three recommendations. Yeah, detaching and and make sure that um, you know if you if you have somebody take out thatch of your turf grass. Um, yeah, it's you know what they're I, doing. <laughs> I know have them know what they're doing. I prefer prefer somebody that actually has a business of doing that, mm -hmm. um, or getting somebody from the golf course. But uh, actually, that's a good business to go into is aer aeration and detaching. So if you want to start your own business, you know that's that's not a bad gig. Um, but you know, with Empire Zoysia grass, Bermuda grass, um, that grass is going to respond a lot better than um, Saint Augustine. That gets a little tricky with verticutting and stuff like that, mm -hmm. batching out. But, you know, there's these thatch rakes that you buy at the store. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a Faith. They're the metal. Um, I bought one and returned the same day. Um, if you want a good workout, go for it. But it's, <laughs> you know, it's 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 not, it's really not worth it. Um, so, but like I said, make sure you get somebody that's well experienced, but it's good to, good to get that thatch layer out of your grass regardless because, you know that when you when you ever have a, a thick layer of thatch, it feels like it feels like you're walking on an air mattress or a sponge, and can actually prevent insecticides from doing their job and from fertilizer reaching down and so on. 
but it also makes it home for different pests such as millipedes and chinch bugs and so on. Uh, overall, it's a bad thing to have a lot of thatch um, in your turf grass. So you want to manage that as best as you can. And managing it goes back to best management practices, making sure you're not using a, for a high nitrogen quick release fertilizer on a frequent basis and watering the heck out of it. Those are two cultural, those are two things that you can do to help keep that thatch under control. Um, yeah, zone of death is not <laughs> recommended. Um, everybody, everybody wants to spray, right, Faith? Everybody wants to spray. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and there's, there's just certain things that you're not going to be able to do. So uh, dethatching, but whenever these millipedes come inside your house, they're going to die very quickly. They're going to desiccate very quickly. So they're not going to take resonance up. This is, this is more of a nuisance thing, and it's not going to last forever. Uh, it'll maybe last for weeks. Uh, but it's not going to last forever. And, and, and if this happens to you, it's probably going to happen year after year. Okay. If those conditions still, um, those conditions still exist. And another, um, another pest that comes out uh, during the, uh, especially during the winter months is this multicolored Asian lady beetle. Yeah. Um, Faith, do you want to talk about this or you want me to? Yeah, sure. So um, this beetle is, really good biocontrol, but it can get into your house. And if you look at, if you point to that, yeah, that pronotum there, there's like a M, some people think it's a W on it. And that's how we can tell this beetle apart, this lady beetle apart from other uh, lady beetles. It's a crevice dweller. It overwinters quite well, and it's going to overwinter in your house is what it is. So while it is um, beneficial, we just don't want to have any of what we call reflexive bleeding. It's a defensive mechanism on your wallpaper or your furniture and whatnot. So the control is really to just vacuum this beetle out. Um, Jim, I don't know that it happens very much in South Central Florida, but I know up, you know, the North, the Panhandle and in states North of us, it can be um, quite the issue. Yeah, we've had it at our, our at our house. Oh, you have? Okay. Yeah, yeah, they were in the chimney. So and, yeah, mm -hmm. my girlfriend has sent me bags of this stuff for class. You know, just to yeah, yeah, show yeah. and tell for class. So. Yeah, year, years ago, my folks' property, my folks' house, it, it was in the chimney, and they came out and uh, <laughs> a ton of them. And um, uh, but notice that this is another another species of ladybug. You notice on the pronotum there, there's no M. Right. So, so look at other harmonias. These, these, uh, these two at the top. One on the left has a characteristic M on the pronotum there. Okay, on that little shield, and that's how you can tell them apart. Um, like ladybugs, ladybugs do have this reflex of bleeding, um, so they can stain. Um, they can also have this foul odor associated with it. Um, and uh, you know, whenever we had them at our house, there wasn't that many. Um, mm. It was a nuisance, but it wasn't that many. Um, not like that on the left, which, you know, yeah. <laughs> can happen in certain cases, but this again is one of those ones and this is, it's, it's not incredibly common, but one that I've heard over the years, um, uh, that people do, um, that people can get inside their, um, can get inside their house. So I started to add a little turf stuff in here so during the during the fall and winter months you typically get a pest um, called a hunting bill bug um, now this is a pest that can feed on that grass in the winter time on uh, in part especially now this is a real this is one of the um, main pests on empire zoysia grass and it's a bill bug but it's a weevil okay uh, so you have that you know that long nose characteristic of weevils um, it feeds on the stems. Now, both, both the adult and the larva feed on the grass. Um, the larva is a grub, it's a little C-shaped grub, um, much smaller than your other, like your large grubs, like you're from your scarabs. And it's not, you know, you may have some grubs in your turf grass. It's not unusual to have grubs, but if you're starting to notice some damage, what you want to do is you want to cut out like a one by one area, square foot piece of turf grass, look underneath the roots uh, and in the soil 
And if you have 10 grubs uh, or more, um, then that's a threshold that you really want to take care of. That's a damaging threshold. If you're out there digging in your grass and if you find one grub, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress over that. Um, especially if you're not seeing any damage. So like I said, most activity occurs in the fall and the winter. Sometimes whenever you want to catch these little critters too, the adults, what you can do is, is it's a trick that us entomology uh, people do to collect insects and that's creating a pitfall trap. And uh, one of the things that we always encourage homeowners to do to the, the calibrate their irrigation and to check their water is this little catch can test. Um, usually tuna cans is what we, you know, typically recommend it's easy to easy to use out there and that's how we use to calibrate the irrigation system make sure you use getting enough water um, um during, on that turf grass so what you can do is you can take that catch can that little tuta can and, and sink it in the ground make it flush level with the um uh with the grass now you can put some water or whatever in there don't put anything toxic like antifreeze or anything like that because pets could drink from it so um you know water's fine and then you can um that little critter that little uh weevil that little hunting bill bug will crawl 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 and fall into that little pitfall trap and so uh that's some ways that you can catch this but my master gardeners in the villages a lot of times whenever they had an infestation of hunting bill bugs they also had a like a little fish pond stuff like that so they found them in their fish pond um maybe dead on the sidewalk and so on um they typically sell a lot more adults in the grubs and they start digging. Here's what build bug damage is. Now, if you sent me a picture of this, um, I would say I have no idea what this is. Um, turf grass is incredibly hard. It's you, you're you're like a little detective when figuring out what to do with it. But um, but this is hunting build bug damage. It's these little characteristic areas. Like I said, what you want to do is you want to cut out a square foot area, and if it in this damage, you will see a ton. Of, of grubs in that turf grass. So um, you're really not gonna have to worry about with St. Augustine grass or, um, or uh, hay grass or for, for this insect, uh, more so uh, that empire zoysia grass. Now, some of the spring and summer pests, we're gonna move into these um, really quick. Uh, and of course, I'm gonna start off with this one that I like to talk about and uh, we talk about this in numerous classes before. I always like to refresh people on this, especially master gardeners. I go around and round with my horticulture agent faith on <laughs> lumber grasshoppers because, uh, you know, lumber grasshoppers can annihilate plants, certain plants, amaryllis, um, agapanthus, those type of plants. That they can't. Um, and they usually come out around March-ish, somewhere around there. And so what they'll do is, you know, they'll, they'll emerge, the females lay their eggs in the soil and the eggs hatch. And then all of a sudden you get the first instar nymphs coming out, which are very similar to this. I'll show you smaller ones, but they're usually black and yellow or black and red. And they're gregarious. So like they like to hang out together. So whenever you have 20 to 50 little baby nymphs feeding, that causes a lot of damage and they'll move in waves. It's amazing the number of, of nymphs there are. Um, but you know, having said that, this is a native species. And uh, so this is a native species to Florida, okay? It has one generation per year. Remember that for your test. Um, it doesn't have several generations per year, only one. They only have one hatch and that's it. Um, now notice the color of this insect. It has the aposomatic coloration of like, stay back, um, could be bad. And so, um, they are poisonous to certain animals. So certain birds have died of ingesting too many lubbers for sure. Um, so that is their defense. There's only one bird that really feeds on them to great success. And that's a uh, larger head shrike, um, which impales them and waits for that toxin to go away a couple of days and comes back and feeds on it. Um, but they also predated against, <laughs> they also are predated against fire ants and other insects. Um, so there is a high mortality rate. Uh, make no mistake about that with the grasshoppers. Um, but um, 
you know, this one right here is that last instar um, where it's molting out of the NIF into the Imago, the adult. And you can see how a little bit light in coloration because that exoskeleton hasn't um, hardened yet. The adults have their own defense aside from the coloration. They do excuse this like brownish mucusy stuff um, from their mouths and that you can get on your hands if you pick them up. That's more of a deterrent against predators like ants and stuff like that. Uh, and of course they do have spines on their leg like most grasshoppers do for defense. Um, but they have about 20, the, the 30 to 50 eggs. Um, and uh, if you want something that, and here are the nips right here. There's the, these are early instar nips. You can see all the frass, all the poop. They're feeding on beach sunflower on this one, but they they even uh, decimated some of the uh, Nandina, heavenly uh, firepower Nandina that we had out there. Uh, but majority of the cases, majority of the plants usually rebound from this. Um, from this uh, uh, feeding. So this is the bane of certain master gardeners. They just want to kill them all. Um, I like to let them live. It's a native species. So it's a, it's a back and forth between uh, my whore agent master gardeners. Um, but uh, I always like to remind people this is a native species. So uh, if they're not causing any damage, leave them alone. Uh, if they are, you know, just pick them off and you reduce that damage to a more manageable um, area. So uh, if you want something to cause a lot of um, Anks among wildlife communities put a picture of this in a, in a wildlife forum faith and you'll see everybody go at each other with uh, with this species is pretty funny but um uh makes a great bug for bug camps too by the way for anybody master gardeners anybody out there working with kids um they're excellent to keep as pets uh just give them some lettuce that they get all their water and everything from there and uh they'll they'll live until about october-ish some longer, some shorter, depends. Uh, they don't fly. Uh, so I use these for my bug camps and the kids really, really love them. And uh, so it's a great way to introduce entomology hands-on for kids using these large, large grasshoppers. And so, you know, the females, um, the females are larger than the males because they have the babies carrying the eggs. So whenever you see the lovers out there, the ones, the, the very big ones are the females, the smaller ones are the males. And it's typically the females that live longer. By observation that I've seen in the demo garden that we have, um, this is just an interesting picture with two males are competing with this female. Um, but other, there are other outbreaks out there um, for insects, and this is the bird grasshopper or the American grasshopper, and this is an insect that we have on a probably it happens once every three or four years uh in Sumter County. I haven't seen Hernando yet. Uh of these infestations, these little short plagues of grasshoppers. It's very I think it's related to the uh the locust that you have in Africa. Um but this is it right here. Now this is a very it's a pretty large grasshopper, not as thick as the lubber, almost just as long, uh, but as a very is a very agile flyer. And so you can see all the damage. This is all the nymphs too, by the way. See all the little babies? All the little babies right there. And so it can damage corn. That's, I think that's corn right there. So you can see all these holes in the leaves. Look at what they did to this palm tree, okay? Pretty much decimated this palm tree. And uh, so they usually have about 60 to, 60 to 80 eggs per grasshopper. And uh, it only, it has about two generations per year and overwinters is the adult. So the, the principal hatching periods are from February to May and sometimes from August to September. So this is another one that can overlap. Now we've had them in Sumter County so bad um, that the, uh, so Faith, Dr. Dr. Caponera, uh, excellent entomologist, one of, you know, they're the entomology department. This is the, this is the damaging threshold on um bird grasshoppers mm -hmm. <laughs> is is yeah. are they chew, are they chewing the screen or not <laughs> and so uh mm -hmm. we actually had that and we actually had um um my boss at the time dr strickland he had dr caponera come down to bushnell because we had a field that was played with uh bird grasshoppers and that was the threshold was are they chewing the screens um but you know one way to get rid of these grasshoppers 
is, is simple mowing. And a lot of times you see these grasshoppers in open fields uh, where there's a lot of tall grass, maybe like a, a, a field, a pasture um, with cows or, or horses. And one of the ways to help reduce that population of grasshoppers is simply mowing, mowing it down. Um, here is a citrus tree that was decimated by grasshoppers. And I've seen that a couple of times in the villages. Um, for my village residents north of 466, back in the day, they used to have a, um, uh, a lot of open area out there with a lot of horses uh, at that north end. And on the horse farms, the homes abutted next to those horse farms. And that's when we get these large outbreaks of American grasshoppers. And you go out to a person's house, Faith, and there would be hundreds and hundreds of American grasshoppers climbing on people's citrus trees and other trees and on the side of the house. Um, and, uh, and you pretty much just, in that case, you know, you pretty much just have to wait through it, sit through it, and wait for that, wait for that to go away. And the next one are these Jadira bugs. And so if you have a rain tree, which is there on the lower right-hand side, Gorteria, uh, which is not a real good plant to have anyway. Um, if you have a rain tree, you're gonna get Jadira bugs. Um, and, uh, and these Jadira bugs will come out in the thousands. So these bugs aggregate to feed on seeds that have dropped to the ground. Uh, they'll feed on the trees overhead. Uh, they'll feed on Coloritaria. They'll feed on Bloom Vine, uh, a ficus, a, uh, uh, was it Jadira uh, is another one that can, uh, that they'll feed on. But um, this is another one in the spring faith that uh, it's al almost like to the month uh, of like March or April. Um, of Jadira bugs coming out every time. And, and we get the worst infestations in Hernando in my other county. Oh. And so that's that's when we start seeing a large amount of critters. But here you have one that, see that little, is feeding on that uh, seed. So it's piercing that insect. But some people think this is a box elder bug, um, but it, it's a little bit different. And this is what the nymphs look like, all red, okay? So they used to have them in a popka. Jim, and then they took out the tree, and then they haven't had them since. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You take out the rain tree, and mm -hmm. you're not going to have them. <laughs> so that's that's a good way to get rid of these little um, crit uh, critters. So there's there's interesting. This is what I read. So there's there's evidence that since the introduction of the golden rain tree, which is called um, uh this insect's mouth parts have become shorter as an adaptation to feed on the plant seed. So this is a native, I believe this is a native insect if I'm not mistaken. And due to this non-native golden ray tree, the insect's mouth parts have become shorter to feed on the plant seeds. So that's kind of like Darwinism, Darwinism in effect, um, pretty neat. Um, it does have these little toxic compounds called cyanolipids, cyanolipids um, um, which uh, this bug sequesters and uses a chemical defense against, against different predators. Also in the springtime, a lot of people, and we talk about yellow jackets. Now I'm gonna talk about paper wasps, which can sting. They're not as aggressive as yellow jackets, um, but if you mess with their nest, actually bump into their nest, um, they're gonna come out and sting you. Um, I was gonna Seriously. say it still hurts. <laughs> it does, it still hurts, and they bite, they sting over and over again. But here's the thing about paper wasps the, the you have a new generation coming out every year. Um, so you have a uh, the queen kind of overwinters in the wintertime. And so in the springtime, early springtime, could be early, it could be February, um, March. If you start to see a paper wasp, okay, just one, and I'm gonna actually advance the slide, I'm gonna come back to this one. So here's a here's a queen, uh, early season. Okay, you can see what she's doing. Okay, so you see her mandibles. So what she's doing is getting the pulp off that wood to make the paper, the paper nest. So what she's going to do is she's going to make her nest. She's going to start with a couple cells. She's going to have babies. That's her daughters, and their daughters are going to. 
I have different roles and raise young, hunt food, and so on. And eventually, the queen is her only job is to have babies, and her daughters will uh, do the rest of the work, defense, and everything else until the fall, this time of year, whenever you start to have the new queens and the males come out. Okay. So, um, if you want to eliminate a whole generation of paper wasps that um, that you may feel uncomfortable with, some venomous arthropods are no joke. Um, they they you can put people killed by um, alligators and snakes and probably spiders and venomous arthropods still um, outnumber that <laughs> as far as fatalities uh, due to anaphylactic shock. I'm I'm allergic to the fire ants. So um, there, it's no joke. So if you have, if you're allergic to them, if you have kids nearby, if you want to eliminate this whole generation from the get go, start looking around in February, March around the eaves, under the eaves of your house, um, maybe under plants, under the leaves where it's protected against the rain. Look for these tiny nests where there's one little wasp. Get rid of that wasp. That's usually the queen. When you get that rid of that wasp, you're not going to have anybody there again. Okay. Uh, when it gets to this level, where there's a lot of wasps, then you have to take precautions whenever you manage that, whenever you have to take care of it, such as a wasp and hornet spray that sprays from afar. Um, I've had, I, Faith, we can write a book on this stuff. Well, I've had people take newspaper. I've had family members do this, take balled up newspaper, light it on fire. Oh no. Okay. Yes, I've had my my grandpa did this and he rolled up newspaper, lit it on fire and put that next to the house to kill the kill the wasp. Don't do that. You can catch your house on fire. Um even faith now um I remember at at PMU whenever I was up there attending some of your classes. Um soapy water works as well, right? It's pretty good. Yeah. You just yeah, you just have to have a lot of it. You, you need to know that you're going to wet down that paper envelope. You have to have enough of that soap and water to do that. Enough of it. Make sure it sprays far. But that that wasp and hornet spray, I think it sprays out 75 feet, if I'm not mistaken. It's it's about 20. Is it 20? Yeah, it's about oh, 20. I was way off. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> I was way off on that. And so, um, but it sprays really far and it knocks them down. Uh, and so that's what you want to do to, to get rid of these critters. But having said that, um, in my house here, uh, on my folks' property, if we have paper wasp living and they're not anywhere near us, I'm not worried about them stinging anybody or whatever, I leave them be. Um, and that's my preference because those paper wasps are beneficial insects. They are good. So they'll go out there and predating against other insects and stuff. So um, it's all in that web, right? So, uh, but if they are posing um, some danger, then go ahead and get rid of them. One interesting fact is that, you know, this is the paper, this is the comb right here. It has a little, it's attached by this little pedestal, this little stalk, which is some, some say this maybe ant repellent. Um, but usually the queen hangs out up here. And so she's usually right here near the pedestal, and that's all of her daughters. Um, here's a, a wasp out there looking. This is a passion vine, and this is an extra floral nectary. So uh, plants such as passion vines have these extra floral nectaries that these ants and wasps will feed on. Whoops. Um, so now is a time for um, the cicada killer as well because cicadas are coming out right now and uh, they have been for several weeks now they're still coming out uh, they usually start in august and you know they'll probably start finishing up here pretty soon and during this time of year, you have this large wasp. some people think it's that badly named murder hornet that you hear on the news um this is this is a cicada killer this is a native wasp looks like a wasp on steroids it is huge and whenever you see a lot of these flying around yeah it can be a little disturbing um, but these these are solitary wasps they are not defending a hive uh, so they're not a, they're not protecting anything they're going after cicadas they're solitary hunters uh except when they mate 
Um, and what happens is, is, you know, this is the largest wasp in Florida. It gets about uh, uh, almost one and a half inches long. Seen in the summer months, burrows underground, uh, sometimes up to four feet deep, depending on the soil type. And you can have 15 cells, one to four cicadas each. They're ectoparasites, so the queen, so the female lays the egg on the cicada. Um, and uh, whenever that egg hatches, that larva feeds on that, that paralyzed cicada or cicadas. And it'll finish its life cycle right then and there and emerge from the hole. This is the hole right there of a cicada killer, a cicada wasp. And that whole cycle will start up again. And um, every year, now only the females sting, the males do not sting. But what she does is, you know, here's, here's, here's um, a female. So she's paralyzed this cicada. And she most likely climbed up this fence because her burrow hole is nearby. And what she'll do is if she's on a tree on a fence, she'll glide down uh, to the hole. And if she's dragging, if they don't know if you've ever heard, heard them do this before, but as they're dragging the cicada, they make a weird like buzzing noise. Um, so you can hear them buzzing on the ground, dragging that cicada into their hole. Um, it's just, this is one of my favorite insects out there just for the size and just how it, um, how, how, what it does and everything. And here's the cicada. And uh, so the cicadas are out. Um, I actually collected some of these the other day for my daughter. And uh, <laughs> these little exoskeletons. So this is what this is what the nymphs look like in the soil. They could be in there for years. Now, we don't have the 17 year cicada here, uh, but our cicadas do come up every year and they'll live for a number. They can live for, you know, two to four years, a little bit more underground feeding. And then they emerge and they don't live very long. And so this is a, they emerge out of the exoskeleton, just like this, much like a butterfly coming out, um, very light skinned because their exoskeleton has to harden. If you, if you see a cicada, light skinned cicada sitting on a tree, don't mess with it because um, it's still, that exoskeleton, exoskeleton is still hardening and you could damage it. It does not have any mouth parts, it's just there to mate. That's all it's doing. Uh, and they come in different sizes, very small, some to large. And in some cases, we have actually in my Publix here, there's an oak tree and it is deafening with cicadas. It is very, very, very loud. Um, but, you know, with these cicadas, there's really not much you're going to do with the cicadas uh, coming out. That's when we depend on the cicada killers to manage that population. So, uh, you know, we said seasonal pest. I, I really don't want to consider these pests um, in a sense because those cicada killers are really beneficial insects out there. It's just one of those things that we see. We get calls this, this time of year about these giant wasps fl flying around. So we got a call from a person in Wildwood thinking it was murder hornet. We got a call from uh, a Publix in the villages. There was half a dozen out there flying around. Um, in this case, we tell people, don't worry about it. They're not going to, it's going to be fine. You know, just don't pick one up. That's my recommendation to you on that. So um, next we have a spring, uh, well, spring and summer insect called a chinch bug. It's not a cinch bug, it's a chinch bug. <laughs> and um, so chinch bugs, you know, a long time ago when I started the villages 16 years ago, um, this was a predominant pest in the turf grass um, at that time when the St. Augustine grass. And we had infestations so bad that I remember driving up to people's houses and I didn't even have, I didn't have to get out of the car. I could open my door and I could see the chinch bugs on the curb there and they were migrating across people's driveways. Um, not hard to find chinch bugs back in the day. And all of a sudden we did, we really didn't for years, we didn't see um, that much damage from them. Uh, for years and all of a sudden they're back and that probably faith i would imagine that probably has to do with resistancy i'm sure with pesticides because they do get resistant pretty quick don't they there's horrible resistance with chinch, chinch bugs yeah and so they live in the thatch so that's one good reason why to leave them the thatch they're not chewing insects okay they're full, they have a mouth part like a mosquito okay and so this is what causes this yellowing okay so they're they're foliar feeding um, 
They're about eighth an inch, the tenth of an inch long. Here is the adult on the left. This is the nymph, okay? One of the instars. You're going to see more nymphs than adults, just FYI. So if you're looking for chinch bugs, don't, you know, look for this one, but expect the nymph. And you see the picture. A lot, a lot of people see, get the publication to see this picture of a chinch bug, and they're looking for something big. It's an eighth of an inch. It's a little bit bigger than an ant. <laughs> it's not very big. And you have to actually go looking for them. If, if at some time, you actually have to peel back the grass and the thatch and watch for them running around. Uh, a skilled person, um, skilled master gardener or agent, what they can do is they can actually take this grass and peel back and look in the sheath of this grass. And you can actually find the first instar, which is red. Very, very tiny, 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 tiny red one. Uh, and you can see that stage uh, in that sheath of the grass feeding. Um, this is usually occurs on water stressed areas, stressed areas in the lawn, um, areas next to sidewalks or driveways near cement curbs, you know, the edging around your grass, um, anywhere where it's stress where you typically see um, chinch bugs. So here you have an area that's stressed and you can see um, this yellowing associated with it. Um, this is actually mowing marks so this is a person who mowed when it was too dry uh, and that's how you see these mowing tracks but um, whenever you test for these chinch bugs uh, look for the chinch bugs right where the living meets the dead okay this is where you want to check check for chinch bugs right in this area right on the edge this is where they're feeding okay uh, this is probably one of the worst cases of chinch bugs i've seen ever see. This is in the Bridgeport of Lake Sumter from my village residence uh, on a corner lot. And they were just fertilizing the heck out of this and watering the heck out of it. Uh, so the chinch bugs loved it. And I went out there and I said, um, you always ask what they're fertilizing, what they're watering with and so on. And they said, no, no, we had chinch bugs. They were checking in this area and there was no chinch bugs in this area. And I'm like, of course there's not, <laughs> it's all dead. And so we walked over here uh, into this neighbor's area and they were, uh, I didn't even have to bend down. They were crawling all over my shoes. They were migrating to this guy's yard. Um, just probably one of the worst cases I've ever seen of chinch bugs. But this had a lot to do with the, the person's management of uh, just using the wrong fertilizer and just watering way, way too much, okay? Um, so that's how you get your chinch bug populations down to, uh, you wanna rotate your insecticides um, for example, uh, these are three examples, okay? There's several out there, but bifenthrin, carbaryl, midocloprid. You want to rotate those out through the year. That's an example because those are three different modes of action. Uh, if you just put bifenthrin, which is ortho, ortho max out there year after year, even one generation will get resistant. So you have to switch it up a little bit. Um, this is that first instar nymph. Look how tiny, that's in the sheath of the grass. That's, look how tiny that is. And it's red, it's orange. You can see this with a magnif magnifying glass. Um, so a skilled person will, will identify these. Uh, this is not a chinch bug. This is a big eyed bug, okay? That's, and we've had landscapers uh, send homeowners these bugs and tell them it's chinch bugs. And I've had homeowners bring these in and say they're chinch bugs misidentification. These are big eye bugs. These are predators. So don't do that. Um, and also don't expect 100% eradication of chinch bugs. It's not going to happen. Never going to happen. So you're looking about 80% at least because uh, you're going to have to some resistance. that's why you want to switch up your modes of action. Okay. So uh, check, start checking for those chinch bugs early in the year. You'll start noticing whenever you start looking at your turf grass areas, look for those early signs of damage start getting on top of it as soon as possible. Could be tropical sod webworm, could be chinch bugs, could be bill bugs, could be mole crickets or whatever. Um, speaking of mole crickets, um, <laughs> mole crickets are another spring pest. Now we have a, a northern mole cricket. I think the northern's a native, I think. Uh, we have a tawny, a short wing. Uh, the tawny is the predominant pest that I see in turf. Um, and in all honesty, we're where I'm at in the villages, we had, we have empire zoysia grass. We have one of the largest areas of empire zoysia grass in the state, which is in the villages. Um, 
so I've dealt with my share of empire zoysia grass over the years. And I just told you hunting billbug is one of the main pests of empire zoysia grass. But throughout the years, by far, in, in Sumter County, <laughs> more crickets are the number one pest, insect pest on empire zoysia grass. Okay, it doesn't even come close to hunting billbugs. So they love the stuff. And they really like mo they really like Bermuda grass and they like the hay grass as well. Um, they will feed on St. Augustine, don't get me wrong, they will. But um, but that's some of their um, favorites. And you'll start seeing those early in the year, May and August. Um, you'll start seeing the adults um, fly. Sometimes they'll fly out and they'll, um, you can find them on your sidewalk. If you have a street lamp, uh, they're attracted to the light. So sometimes you see a lot of damage. If you, if you lived on a, um, my experience, if I go out to a yard and they have one of those big, big, large street lights, like on a corner lot of a home, um, yeah, that, that's a big beacon for more crickets. Um, I see a lot of damage there in the past. So um, you can knock out the adults with probably like dialogs, uh, but you have to, you really have to go with um, the nymphs which you're going to have to control in the summertime. So you want something that's going to go and get the nymphs in the ground. You get the nymphs, you're going to have better control. Uh, but these mole crickets, keep an eye out for them. Uh, this is what their damage looks like, irregular mounds. Um, and you have these little holes. Um, uh, this is a golf course green. The one on the right is a yard in the villages. Um, and right next to it was a little street lamp, go figure. So um, keep an eye out for those. Um, and they, they also do have beneficial nematodes for mole crickets. They do have that out there. Um, so they do have some biological and it works pretty good. I know people used it. Um, anything you wanna add on mole crickets, Faith? I am not a good mole cricket person. I <laughs> and I love those fossorial legs that they have on them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you know, they do make sounds too. They, yes, do, they, do. they, they do chirp at night. So that, and, that could be mole crickets that you're hearing. <laughs> right. And you can, you can actually tell the species of mole cricket that you're yep. dealing with by the frequency of the sound. Yeah. Fre frequency of the sound, also the pronotum here with the different spots and stuff. Uh, you can tell the difference on them and so on. But yeah, they got the cool little fossil legs that they, it, this cool little critters. Most people see pictures of these if they're coming from up north, they have no idea what these are. Um, but uh, those are the mole crickets. And another, um, now this, why did I put large patch under spring and summer? Large patch is actually a fall and winter disease. It's not as such spring and summer. So large patch, you're going to start seeing a large patch in a couple of months, um, without a doubt. And it's, you can control it culturally again, using avoid, ex, avoid excess, um, quick release nitrogen and fertilizers. Um, know what to look for as far as that goes, ash your agent, um, water, but even if you don't, even if you follow all these guidelines, you can probably still get it. Um, I get it every year. Uh, I don't get it anymore because where I got it, there was an oak tree and it was the shade from the oak tree, keeping that area a little bit more moist than other areas. And so that, that historically got large patch because this is a disease. It's a fungus. Fungus likes moisture, reduce the moisture, reduce the disease. Okay. Uh, that tree blew down and guess what? No large patch in that area. It's pretty amazing. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty easy to take care of um, if you get on top of it quick and get it quick and get it taken care of. Um, you're not, it's not gonna, you're not gonna see recovery immediately. Okay, I'm just gonna let you know that. So if you spray this area, it's not gonna turn green next week. Okay, if you have su substantial damage, it may be spring till that grass recovers. Okay, so. Um, this is a cool season disease. However, I put this picture on the left-hand side. Have you ever seen that before, Faith? Mm -mm. So I took this years ago uh, and I had no idea what it was. This was in the summertime. And uh, it looked like alien crop circles to me. <laughs> and, uh, and I brought Dr. Phil Harmon down. Phil didn't know what mm -hmm. it was. He had no idea what it was. 
But we sent it in and Phil, Phil determined that this was large patch, but this was the damage caused in the wintertime and uh, fall and winter or in late winter. And the grass was just having a hard time coming back. And you can see how the grass is starting to fill back in the center. So it's not active. Okay. Um, but this is the kind of damage it can cause. And this is Empire Zoysia grass. You typically see this a lot on Empire Zoysia grass. And this is in the villages as well. So pretty interesting, cool picture um, for that large patch. Here's another case of what large patch looks like too. Very characteristic. This is uh, being controlled. Um, you can see all this irregular outline, okay? This is all large patch. And you can, um, if you can send in a sample, depending on where you're at, you can send a sample to the lab um, to have them diagnose it if you want, or you can just take this picture to your horticulture agent in your county and that horticulture agent should be able to diagnose this as large patch. Um, in my county, in Sumter County, um, we can actually, you know, determine it by picture. And if you want, we actually put it under a microscope and, uh, and we can look, we know what to look for as far as regarding that goes. Um, but um, like I said, it's actually pretty easy to take care of, but it, it, in this, in this turf grass right here, if I was to start applying a, a fungicide right now, that grass is not going to fully recover until spring. So just, just understand that. Okay. It's not quick because the grass is dormant. It's not actively growing. Um, but if you don't control it, it, it can really wipe out that turf grass. Um, back in the day, it, some people call them brown patch. It's technically not accurate, but some people use it as, as the same term, brown patch, large patch. Regardless, it's a fungus. It's a cool season fungus. So um, keep, a, keep a lookout for, for that disease. And like I said, the main characteristic, look for that yellow on the outside. Okay. Whenever you start treating it, if you don't see any, pro, any more progression, that means you stopped it, okay? That's a good thing. Hmm. Another similar fungus out there that this is a warm season disease is called take all root rot. And uh, takes, all, takes all the roots. Um, if you can pronounce the name, go for it. I cannot pronounce the scientific name. <laughs> <laughs> Phil can. <laughs> I can't do that. That's actually Phil right there. Um, oh. <laughs> is, That's uh, a great we're doing, shot. We're doing a site visit with Massey, I think at the time. And um, so this is a area of large, uh, not large, take our root rot and take our root rot. It looks, it's variable. It's not really, you know, it could look different. It's not like large patch or dollar spot. We can pretty much gauge based on the symptoms of what it is. Large, uh, take our root rot, you really can't. Take our root rot, you'll start noticing some dying grass. Um, and it's just not, just not doing well. It could be progressive over the years. and. Uh, and once you get take all, it's pretty much you got take all. In some areas, you just have to plant something else there, because uh, you. We've had homes in Brooksville, in, in Hernando County. They've they, this development replaced year after year. Oh my gosh, I want to say I want to say close to 100 homes with take all root rot. I did a sample out there in that community in 59. I forgot. I'm gonna say let's say 20. I think I took 20 samples. 20 samples, and I think 19 came out with take all root rot. That's how predominant it was. And um, so what causes take all root rot is stress. Could be, and it's, there's a lot of things that can cause this, but from my experience, what usually causes this is overwatering. That's number one, mowing too short. That's a big one. Mowing too short um, will cause this, especially in St. Augustine grass and, and zoysia grass. Um, High pH can do it as well, but it's usually overwatering and mowing too short based on my experience. That's the number one cause. Um, how you determine if this has take all root rot, again, take it to your extension agent, master gardeners. Um, you know, in our lab, we, we actually put under a microscope. It's very easy to diagnose. It, it'll, take you five, it'll, it'll take me five minutes. Um, you look for these little hyphopodia, which look like little puzzle pieces, pretty interesting. And, um, and that lets you know if it's um, take all root rot, so. Okay, we're gonna finish. I don't have time. We're gonna have to end up here pretty soon. <laughs> but um, blind mosquitoes uh, are another outbreak that we have um, in the spring and summer months. And these, and, and Faith, blind mosquitoes, um, 
they don't they don't bite you right these are no but they're plague pests i consider them plague pests they are plague pests and and whenever you get them it just annoys the heck out of me and again uh i see in areas where there it's like little retention ponds right because they're they they're like mosquitoes so they lay their eggs in the water so you have retention mm -hmm. ponds and a water nearby you can have an outbreak of these blind mosquitoes and they don't bite but think of having thousands of little midges, these blind mosquitoes on your screen. You know, if you're trying to sit inside your lanai, trying to enjoy yourself and open the door and they all fly in, they're landing on you, landing on your beverage and everything else like that. And guess what? There's not a thing you can do about it. Okay. Unless, you know, maybe you get the community to put some, um, um, some uh, BT or stuff like that in the, pond but i don't know how effective that's going to be but um, um i know they do have um insectivorous fish you know uh and other things some of the igrs but you know that's i don't know how effective that is going to be on a big level a level like you know large retention pond in the villages or other places that's what the larva um look like some people call them blood worms or wigglers so pretty interesting and so they're so, very similar. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, it's kind of cool because they have a variety of hemoglobin that binds the oxygen that so tightly that that oxygen is not necessarily usable to them, but it still causes that red color in the oh, blind mosquito. Cool. Yeah. And of course, year round, you know, they're just like mosquitoes. And, uh, you know, spring and summer, we do have outbreaks of mosquitoes. Uh, we actually had an encephalitis alert in Sumter County a couple of weeks ago, okay, um, we have sentinel chickens out in the back and, uh, and they tested, they tested positive. Um, so they gave us a little warning, <laughs> the mosquito um, control. And uh, so uh, you have different types of 80s of GPI and Ablopictus, uh, the crane flies, which are harmless. I think that's a serophora. And uh, but with all these type of mosquitoes, it's pretty much common sense. Just eradicate all the water sources if you can. In some cases, almost impossible. My daughter gets eaten up every single day. Um, was getting eaten up every single day at her little daycare center because next to it's a little swampy area. And they call the spray for mosquitoes. But guess what? I mean, you can spray for some mosquitoes, but spraying is not going to help for these guys unless you do a larvicide. Um, and do some other stuff out there. Uh, but uh, make sure you wear your mosquito repellent. Make sure you read the label for little ones. Um, I think you have to read the label, but I think they I think it's three and up, if I'm not mistaken, on products like oil and lemon eucalyptus. Um, and uh, apply it to your apply it yourself, apply it to your little one to help from them getting those mosquito bites and and Yes, people ask me all the time, certain people attract more mosquitoes than other people. That is true, okay? And if you happen to be, this is what um, you can spray for those types of mosquitoes, um, mosquito bits, mosquito dunks. This is what I put in my bromeliads. This is what you put in your fish ponds or so like that. That only kills mosquitoes. Um, so you can, in midges, that, so that'll work for them as well. And if you happen to go in Gainesville um, on a game day, if you go down the boardwalk near um, the band field where the practice field, um, they have those little black gravid traps out there. Did you see them, Faith? Oh, am I on? Sorry, I was oh, on sorry. mute. <laughs> Oh no! Okay, did you, I was like, I was like, I hope I didn't lose connection. So, did yeah. you they, did you see the little black gravit traps on the boardwalk? I I have not because I try and avoid game day. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta see you. I gotta see you a picture of them. So they're little people. They have little signs to tell them what people they are. They're little little traps to attract these little mosquitoes. And this is what they have going up to game day. There's a little boardwalk next to the water, and this is what they have every so many feet apart these little gravit traps to attract these mosquitoes and to kill them. So it's pretty, pretty amazing technology coming out of UF and so on. Um, 
yeah, we'll skip this. But um, cockroaches, yeah, look for Australians this time of year, just like the just like the um, um, Suriname cockroach, because they'll be coming inside your house with the cooler months as well. Um, flat cockroaches with a little Batman signal on it right there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead. Um, <laughs> last last one I'm gonna do is because we're gonna end it because I'm going over as always. Um, yeah, we have. Did you know that termites swarm during different times of year? And so here you have the Formosan termite swarming from March all the way to July. That's when we typically see them. Then you have, where's Virginicus? Particular study of Virginicus, Eastern sub. Look at that, different types of swarming. Okay. Even though, even though the, the cone nose termite has a little short interval that now's a termites right there on the bottom. Um, so even with these termites, you can have different swarming seasons uh, associated with them. Uh, and that starts to happen almost, you know, depending on species, um, but different species happen during different times of year. And that really helps for identification as well. Um, but here's a, out in my Brooksville office, a swarm of termites right in our um, uh, parking lot <laughs> in our wooded area. And uh, they didn't last long. They were dropping the wings and the ants were eating them. See them? I think these are the ants. I forgot what kind of ants those were. You told me one time and I forgot what they were. Uh, but they were feeding on all the termites. I can't remember. I can't remember. Yeah. And it, oh, yeah. Last one springtime and the tussock moth so the tussock moth is something that we get constantly in the spring and uh so here's they're sexually dimorphic there's the male there's the female and they do have these little urticating spines these little um barbs so they are venomous in a sense so they they're far from the tree and it really you know people can get um uh it, it i want to say it stings really bad but it can itch irritate people's skin really, really bad, depending on the type of person. So this is what the adult looks like. This is what the caterpillars look like. And they come in different shades and everything. And they'll be in the thousands, um, in some cases, dropping from trees, dropping on you, dropping up on your neck, and so on. And um, can be a real big problem. There's really not much you're going to do with that either. It's just pretty much sitting and waiting it out just like the love bugs here's what the pupa look like even if you go ahead and touch this pupa with your bare hand you it can irritate as well okay um and there's some more too so more toxic moss and you can see the barbs close-up version of the barbs these are the barbs right here the tufts right here this is the ones that has that venom in there okay so uh, you know when Keeping these guys outside of your house, what Faith said earlier, it's exclusion. See how there's light in between here? Okay. Um, make sure all your screens are fixed. Okay. Make sure you eliminate as, min as many entry points as you can from these little critters from getting inside your house. Okay. And, uh, and that'll help. And also keep shrubs away from <laughs> the foundation of the house <laughs> and faith we're we're going to hopefully come out here pretty soon with a publication for everyone on uh keeping landscapes away uh keeping pests away with with uh with landscaping methods so we'll have that out for everyone in the near future and uh there's excluding devices excluders are a good one uh for any screen mesh hardware and stuff like that uh, so that's all good stuff. So we're going to uh, go ahead and end it. Sorry, I went over like I do every time. So um, I'm going to get some, some questions and I'm going to send out the poll really quick. So I'm going to send out the post. Save questions. I think I covered everyone. Oh, um, Faith, did you know that millipedes have two legs per segment? <laughs> what do you know about that? <laughs> All right. And centipedes have one pair per segment. Oh, one pair. That's right. That's how we separate them. That's right. One pair per segment. <laughs> That's true. I'll keep quiet. I'll keep quiet on that question. All right. So 
Let's see a question. So Julieta. Um, okay, we already answered that one. Yep. <laughs> so Julieta, are lubber grasshoppers occasionally carrying eaters? Meaning would they feed on a dead or injured fellow fat lubber grasshopper? I have seen that, Julieta. And my agent took a picture of that. He has a picture of that. Did you know that, Faith? I did not. Feeding a, a, a grasshopper. It wasn't feeding on, eggs, on a, a molt. Okay. A adult grasshopper feeding on a dead, an adult lubber grasshopper feeding on a dead lubber grasshopper. So he's, he showed me it and I didn't believe it. And uh, yeah, I've seen it. So I'm sure, Julieta, have you seen something like that? Yeah, the, the rain tree is not the native host. And unfortunately, where I live a long time ago, my mom planted rain trees in our pasture and uh, before we knew they were invasive. And now, if you live in Pasco County, it's near uh, Fort King Road. And so all of the rain trees you see on Fort King Road, unfortunately, probably came from my mom. All right. So Nancy, um, besides mole crickets, are there any other pests that are drawn to the streetlights? Um, well, there's different types of insects that are drawn to the streetlights uh, and so on. But as far as the, the damaging ones for turf grass, in a lot of cases, that's where I see heavy mole cricket activity in the past. So brown patch or large patch and zoysia in the villages, how often do you treat it monthly? Uh, it depends based on what, what you have on the label. There's different, there's different active ingredients that work different ways. Um, there's one, uh, forgot what it was called. The, uh, oh, it starts with a T and I think it, can't think of it. I think that you know, that's only a one-time shot, but there's ASIC strobin uh, out there, thiefenate methyl. Um, that's a one time, one time. And, um, or there can be ASIC strobin um, out there, microbutanol, I think it's another one. Uh, but you have to, like the, the Bayer product, there's one in a Scott's product um, and so on. Um, but read the label. Sometimes you treat it monthly. Sometimes it takes, sometimes it's only one shot deal. So um, you just have to read it. And it, it, it usually, all those are usually um, systemic as well. Um, who says the long presentations are good too. Well, <laughs> Vicki, uh, we got your email. Just to remind me about the recording. All right, good job. All right, so if you have any, anybody has any more questions, just type in the Q and A. So we'll go over the questions really quick. So large patch is a summer disease. That is false. It's cool season disease. Lubber grasshoppers are non-native species that have two generations per year. And note, they're one generation native species. Uh, Faith, how many legs do millipedes have per, how many pair of legs per segment? It's two per segment. <laughs> yep. And Jim, I just put in our on our side the chat. I have the Edis link to a bunch of turf diseases that people Good. that you can add onto your email when it goes out. Good. Um, I'm gonna send that. Hold on, I can't do that. Uh, whoops! No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I <laughs> see. I'm trying to send it to everyone because you send it to the panelists. See if yeah. you, there's a thing on the bottom says, there's a little arrow says click to everyone and go ahead and paste okay. that again. Let me see if I can get that to work. Um, so, let me see. Tussock moss have venomous CD or bristles or hair. That is true. 100% good. All right. No one put yes on the love bugs. Thank you, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another question. Fire ants are eating my pigeon feed flowers. They're probably going, I don't know if that's a legume. I don't know if that has an extra floral nectary on it or not, or it might. Are they actually eating your flowers, Julia? Or are they going after something else? 
and something else eating your flowers. I don't know if the fire, I don't know if fire ants eat flower petals or not. That's something I don't know. Faith, do you know that? Say it again. I'm sorry. Julieta said that the fire ants are eating her uh, pigeon pea flowers. You know, I wouldn't put it past those the fire buds. The stuff buds like were that, not, but yeah. I, if if there are extra floral nectaries in the buds of the flowers, it may be possible that there's damage. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julieta. We yeah. love those. Julieta, thank you. Also, she's going to be on my advisory committee. So nice. Yes, I'm doing something new. And uh, so, um, yeah, I also sent out for those that I sent an email. If you're wondering what this advisory committee is, it's it's um, basically we meet a couple of times in the year and we'll sit and have a conversation. It's basically you're going to give me some suggestions about what to include in the future, um, what ideas, what presentations, how I can reach different audiences and so on. Uh, it's advisory in nature and advisory committees, for example, some of the things they've helped me with in the past, um, they've helped me um, get rooms and rec centers. Uh, my One of my advisory committee members say, hey, you should, do a, you should do a wildlife class in the villages like you did for landscaping. And that's what we do now in the Enrichment Academy. It's very popular. Um, I didn't think of that. That wasn't my idea. That was uh, my uh, one of my advisory committee members. So um, uh, you know, we'll meet Zoom meeting. And won't be long. We'll share some of the. I'll share some of the things that that's happening, uh, some of the numbers and everything, and just pick your brains as far as what, um, where where we can go in the future, how we can improve our webinars and and uh, and so on. So this is something new. I usually keep it in county in person with my county clientele, but uh, we're going to try something new with with our virtual um, members. So I know some of y'all have signed up for that. So you'll. I'll send y'all a the meeting notes here pretty soon so we're doing a faith we're doing if you want to attend that one you're more than welcome i have one for my natural resources my wildlife yeah. stuff and i have one for urban pest management your webinar is rock thank you all right thanks julieta all right so if anybody doesn't have any more questions this friday we do have a webinar um on attracting butterflies and uh, so that'll be me. Um, and uh, so that was my thing a long time ago at a monstrous butterfly garden. And uh, so I'm going to um, share some of the tips and tricks that I use to attract a whole bunch of butterflies to your yard, some of the plants, the species themselves. And uh, so that'll be this Friday at one o'clock. And uh, so that'll be in the newsletter. And again, if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, just send me email. For y'all that have attended, I got re emails. I will send a, the recording of this presentation um, to you. Okay. So with that, everyone, thank you so much for 